Yes, hi, good morning. Um, hope everyone's doing well. I, I hope you all can see my screen. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Kamran Riaz, and I have the uh, privilege and perhaps dubious honor of teaching you all optics for the next uh, six hours. Of course, uh, this is sort of the most uh, favorite subject of everybody. Uh, but we'll go ahead and try to make this uh, uh, somewhat relevant and somewhat useful, hopefully, both for uh, clinical exams as well as for, uh, sorry, for written exams as well as for, for clinical practice. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, let's see, is this going to go through? There we go. Okay. So again, I have no financial interest in this lecture. Um, uh, I do write a lot of the questions for optoquestions.com, for which I get financial compensation. Some of you uh, may be familiar with that uh, website. May have some unrelated disclosures as you have there. I do have probably another disclosure that should be important to mention here. Uh, just a couple days ago, we actually published our book. This is a book which I feel very indebted to Osler for since many students over the years uh, encouraged me to write this book along with uh, Vike Vicente, one of our previous uh, lecturers. And so this is Optics for the New Millennium and it's uh, um, available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and also will be available through Osler. And the reason I mention this, uh, it's a little bit of shameless uh, self-promotion, I agree, but um, the book is divided into three parts. And this is really based on a lot of the audience and participant feedback over the years. So part one of the book is going to be focusing on written exams. So pretty much what you all are here to study for. Uh, part two will be hopefully once you pass uh, the written exams uh, at a couple of months, then you can uh, uh, study for the oral boards and the optics for the oral boards is completely different than what you'll need to know for uh, the written exams. And, and many students over the years told us there really was no good book for uh, the oral boards and cl uh, clinical practice. Um, and part three of, of, well, will be uh, information about um, surgical uh, optics as well too. So kind of like a one-stop compendium that hopefully will be useful, not just for exams, but also for uh, cataract surgery as well as refractive surgery uh, as well. And we've intentionally written it in a very educational and, uh, uh, but more importantly, uh, entertaining style. So not kind of a high formal, put you to sleep type of book. It still probably will put you to sleep, but uh, for those of you who may have heard some of my other lectures, it's it meant to be a little bit more entertaining uh, and sort of engaging with a lot of uh, pop culture references, mnemonics, memes, and things like that thrown in there. So anyway, I uh, just had to put that in there for uh, promotion. Um, let's see here. Oh, great. <clears throat> All right. So a couple of other guidelines here. So these lectures are going to be mainly geared towards the written boards. The optics for the oral boards are completely different topics. So the written exam is going to be focusing on a lot of um, calculations and problems and things like that, whereas the uh, oral boards is going to be more about explaining things. How are you going to refract a patient? How are you going to troubleshoot glasses? Uh, that sort of thing here. So again, hopefully you all pass this uh, written boards and then you'll be able to come join us for the oral boards course uh, as well too. So why should we study optics? I mean, you know, you know isn't uh, glaucoma and cornea and retina and these things much more important? Well, remember, uh, at least for the sake of the boards, the optics questions are worth the same amount of points as every other uh, question on the written qualifying exam. So my goal, the way I teach, I've been teaching this now for seven years is really to make you pass the exam. I'm not trying to make you a Jedi master of optics. So uh, sometimes it may seem that I'm dumbing down the material, but I think over the years, students have appreciated that approach. So I'm gonna teach this in a lot of, with a common sense way with a lot of mnemonics and shortcut explanations, rather than going into a whole lot of theory and philosophy behind optics. Always remember that the ECSC is the final arbiter for the uh, thing here. Um, you know, you can always feel free to stop and ask questions anytime. These formats are uh, uh, much more difficult now that, now that we're online, but if there's a burning question, you can certainly use the chat or chime in. I don't mind at all. It's always good to try to get those questions answered um, as we're going through here. Um, students over the years always ask, you know, well, do I have to do it this way or can I use another technique? You know, for example, when we get to U plus V equals V and some people like to work with one over little U, others like to convert it for a uh, 100 over little u. And just remember that it's not like Olympic figure skating where you have to impress the judges. As long as you get the correct final answer, there's no style or elegance point. So whatever method works for you, I really don't have uh, strong feelings on that. And so um, when we solve some of the problems, I'm going to try to show several methods to solve the problem. For example, when we get to uh, sphere cylindrical notation power crosses, there's several ways to do that. 
And you may find that one technique works better for your learning style. I'm gonna mainly cover topics that I think will be on the exam. Obviously I don't uh, write for the exam or be able to teach this course. So you're gonna see some slides where it's just written as OIO, which stands for review on your own. Uh, and I won't spend a lot of time during this, uh, you know, these six hours that we have together to try to get through. Now, most of the questions, thankfully, on optics are based on a limited number of concepts. So there's no groundbreaking research that's happening um, each year um, where you have to kind of keep up to date with things like with, you know, with glaucoma or cataract or, you know, cornea or things like that. So all they do each year is that it's the same concepts, but they're just going to change the numbers and things like that. Obviously, if you're absolutely closed, yes, and move on. Finally, the calculations are meant to be simple. If you find yourself suddenly doing very complicated math, stop and check your equations and numbers. They're not going to let you use a calculator. So um, the, the, the math that we're going to do in the problems that I'm going to show, as well as the math that typically appears on most years on the written exam, uh, should be relatively uh, easy here. So a couple of acknowledgments here to Danny Wee and uh, Vike Vicente. Uh, Vike teaches for Osler, but these are my co-authors and co-editors uh, on the book that I mentioned here. So this slide here kind of just shows you all of the things that you do should not study on for the written qualifying exam. Ironically, these are super high yield for the oral board. So hopefully, again, you all will pass this exam in a couple of months when you're studying for your oral boards, um, you can uh, study these topics. But please don't spend a whole lot of time uh, talking or, or studying these topics because you'll find that um, these topics will be more relevant uh, a little bit later. This slide here is sort of the slide that you kind of want to memorize. These are all the optics equations that you'll need to know. I've tried to condense them into one singular slide that, um, you know, right before you walk into the testing center or whatever, you may want to review these and, and know these uh, by heart. They will not give you these equations. So a lot of stuff to cover here. You can see that that's going to be our agenda for the um, next couple of hours. We're going to try to, you know, take some breaks every hour or so, at least for five, 10 minutes to stretch and, you know, you know drink plenty of coffee and, uh, you know, that sort of thing just to stay awake. And I'll try to keep you awake as best as I can. All right. So let's go ahead and get started with um, introduction to, uh, to geometric optics. So remember that there are different worlds in the universe of optics. So just like the movie Interstellar, where each of those planets had its own unique rules and properties. Um, similarly, in the universe of optics, um, depending on whether we're talking about physical optics, which is light uh, sort of moving in waves or quantum optics, there are different rules and different laws that we will have to uh, keep in mind. Thankfully, for us, for us as ophthalmologists, most of the time we are working in the world of geometric optics. So imagine that's sort of like the, the water planet in interstellar where we feel like we're going to have aged about 25 years studying uh, geometric optics. But one of the big reasons I bring this up is one of the assumptions that we're going to make in the world of <clears throat> geometric optics is that we're going to assume that light travels in linear rates. So for example, if we have this candle light, that we're going to assume that the light is going to travel in rays in basically straight lines emanating from this candle from the source point source of light in all different directions. Now, we're going to refer to these light rays sometimes as a pencil of light rays that in, a, in other words, there are a bunch of parallel light rays that are emanating from that source object. So don't get confused by light ray and pencil of light rays. It's all just sort of the same thing, just straight lines of light that are emanating from a particular object. But we're gonna make a couple of um, assumptions here. We're gonna say that light rays that travel in a medium are naturally divergent. They're trying to move away from each other. So light rays were practicing uh, social distancing long before the COVID pandemic. So light rays are always trying to get away from each other. But when we're solving problems, we're going to consider them to be uh, parallel when uh, trying to figure out where is a light ray when it strikes a lens or a mirror, where is the image going to be formed? And therefore, the light ray can get affected by an external source, such as a plus power lens. And then the light rays are going to come together. They're going to converge. Uh, other times, they may remain parallel. And other times, they're going to diverge. Um, in real life, we can see that if we have this so-called pencil of light rays here. I hope you can see my arrow. So you have this pencil of light rays here uh, that is going to go through a hole. So this is like a pinhole. We're going to have some of these light, light rays are going to diverge. Some of them are going to remain parallel and some of them are going to converge. Okay. 
The other rule that we're going to assume here is that these light rays are going to always travel from left to right by convention. Now, when light rays in geometric optics, when they travel along in a medium, they kind of do some one of the above three things. In other words, they may converge, uh, they may converge, they may stay parallel, or they may diverge. But when they encounter an object, one or more of the things may occur. They may undergo refraction, and un under the topic of refraction, there's distortion and dispersion, which we'll talk a little bit about. They may reflect, such as a, with a mirror. Um, they may absorb, they may diffract, they may scatter, they may undergo polarization. For our purposes right now, we're going to really focus primarily on refraction and reflection. We're not going to care too much about some of these others uh, until we get into uh, physical optics with scattering and polarization. Diffraction is certainly very important when we talk about uh, diffractive multifocal IOLs and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, we really don't care too much about absorption. So let's kind of talk about uh, refraction. So in order to introduce this concept, we're going to say that light rays are always going to travel the fastest in a vacuum, uh, approximately uh, 300 um, uh, million meters per second. So the light rays are going to slow down, however, when traveling through other media, such as water, such as through um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the, the, the vitreous or traveling through a lens and things like that. So the refractive index is simply a ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum, which is always going to be faster than anything else, compared to the speed of light in a given material. So the n is always going to be greater than one. So the, whenever you have a higher value of n, it means that the light is going to be moving much slower as compared to a medium that has a lower value of it. So this is like, ah, who the heck cares about this? Well, for example, when we're doing cataract surgery and we're doing optical biometry, we use an, an, an assumed refractive index for the entire length of the eye, which is 1.3375 in the United States for most of the optical biometry devices. In Europe, it's 1.332. But we know that that's not accurate. The cornea has its own refractive index. The aqueous has its own refractive index. The lens has its own refractive index. The vitreous has its own refractive index. So many times, especially in long eyes and short eyes, one of the reasons why the axial length may be inaccurate is because we're using a false refractive index to say that the whole eye is, uh, has the same refractive index. So again, this is, uh, th this is an important concept uh, clinically as well. And when we talk about optics, when we talk about things like the power of a lens in a different media, we're going to see how the power of the lens and the, or the index of refraction can affect the power of the lens. In other words, if you have a lens in air, its power is going to change when you immerse that lens underwater. Again, you're like, uh, who the heck cares? Well, well, you know, if we have an intraocular lens that is bathed in aqueous versus what happens when we put silicone oil, there's going to be differences in the power of that lens. So again, I just mentioned those clinical examples to show why we should care in addition to why we need to know this information in order to pass this silly exam. As I mentioned, when light rays go from one medium into another, one of three things may actually happen. So they may undergo uh, refraction, they may undergo reflection. Um, again, we're not gonna care too much about absorption. So what is refraction? We're gonna simply say that refraction means that when the light ray goes from one medium into another, that light ray is going to get, uh, it's going to undergo bending, right? So for example, here we have this light ray, it's uh, encountering this, uh, barrier here. Let's call this this like an air water interface, for example, or a lens. What doesn't really matter what it is, but this light ray is going to undergo refraction. It simply means that this light ray is going to undergo bending um, from as it passes from one medium into another. So it's not going to con continue along as a straight line. Um, let's see, the pointer options. There we go. So it's not going to continue along as a straight line. It is under. It is going to basically get bent this way. Reflection simply means that the light ray is going to just bounce away, and it's going to bounce away from this medium. So, for example, with a mirror, that's probably the best example of that. And we really don't care too much about absorption, as I mentioned. There. So let's focus about refraction. So when when we're refracting a patient in clinic and trying to give them glasses, what are we doing? We're just simply trying to bend the incoming light ray in an advantageous direction so that the light ray lands directly on the retina. That's all we're doing with refraction. When we